Hey guys, we're solving physics paper 1 today. 9702 variant 1 2, February March 2022. Right? So, the threshold was released as well. The grade for A was at 27, B was at 24. C was at 20, D was at 16, and E was at 12, okay? So typical 27 to 28 is required for an A, and 33 to 35 is required for an A star, okay? So the formula sheet has been changed, and electric field has been excluded. It's it, it excluded, okay? It's not in the syllabus anymore in A's. This is really important for your exam, right? I'd recommend testing yourself before watching this video. I'm going to attach the threshold and question paper with mark scheme below. You can try doing it. And remember to drop a like and subscribe to the channel, okay? If you like the content. It would help me a lot. Stop it. Get some help. So, let's begin. This is the formula sheet. What could not be a measurement of a physical quantity? Okay, so what is the quantity actually? It's a number with a unit basically. So 10 Kelvin, this looks good. 25 terameters. This also looks good. So what about B? Basically, look at B. Interesting. Okay. Joules. Basically, work done is equal to force into distance, right? So, 11 joules per newton per meter. So, joules is basically newton meter and we also have per newton per meter here. What's happening? All the units are being cancelled out. We only, we are only left with a magnitude a value here. That's why it actually has no unit. The answer should be B. A computer memory stick is labeled as having a storage capacity of 128 gigabytes. Okay, the letter B stands for byte, which is a unit. What is the equivalent storage capacity? So giga refers to 10 to the power 9. Okay, so 128 into gigabytes. So it's 128 into 10 to the power 9, which is, if you input it in your calculator, 1.28 into 10 to the power 11 bytes. We're getting an answer of B. 2 is B. A man of mass 75.2 kg uses a set of weighing scales to measure his mass three times. He obtains the following readings. Okay. So which statement describes the precision and accuracy? It is not precise to 0.1 kg. This is wrong. It is precise to 0.1 kg since we're getting the first decimal place. So 3 A and B are wrong. It is precise to 0.1 kg, uh, but not accurate to 0.1 kg, okay? Because all of them are not 80.2. If they were all 80.2, it would have been accurate to, uh, you know, 0.01 kg. But it is accurate to 1 kg, though, because all of them match in the first place. Understood? Okay, moving on to the next one. Which statement about scalar and vector quantities is correct? A scalar quantity has direction, but not magnitude. Wrong. Scalar quantity has magnitude, uh, but direction, but not direction. Right. So, 4 is B. Vector has both, by the way. How can the acceleration of an object be determined? So, acceleration is actually the gradient of the velocity time graph. Okay? This is quite simple, straightforward. The gradient of a displacement time graph is velocity. A sprinter takes a time of 11 seconds to run a 100 meter race. She first accelerates uniformly from rest, reaching a speed of 10. She then runs at constant speed of 10 until the finish line. Okay, so it's like this. Um, so she reaches a speed of 10 and then runs at constant speed of 10 until she reaches the finish line 
So the area of this whole graph, right, is basically 100 meters and the total time taken is 11 seconds. We don't know how long she took to reach the constant speed though. Okay. But we don't know this, the area of this trapezium, half into height of 10 into A plus B, we can call this A, A plus 11, this is B, is actually equal to 100. So let's do this. 100 into 2 by 10, right? So A plus 11 is equal to 100 and A, sorry, A plus 11 is equal to 20. A is equal to 9. So this is 9 and this is 11. So how much is this going to be? 11 minus 9 is 2, okay? So she took 2 seconds to reach 10. We know that V is equal to U plus 80 and um, 10 is equal to 0 plus 2 into A, A is actually equal to 5, 6 should be D. Moving on to 7, this is a common question. A single horizontal force F is applied to a block X, which is in contact with a separate block Y as shown. The block remains in contact as they exert along a horizontal friction less surface. Air resistance is negligible. X has a greater mass than Y. Okay, so listen, both of them will not experience F, okay? This F will be divided in between them. However, since they're touching, they will have the same acceleration. But since a mass of X is greater, it will receive a greater proportion of the force because F is equal to MA and A is equal to F by M. Since mass is greater, the proportion of force must also be greater to maintain that constant acceleration, okay? And this was also given. Now the acceleration of x is equal to f divided by x wrong because x is not getting the full thing. The force that x exerts on y is equal to f wrong. It's not. Suppose if x gets 3 fourth of f, uh, y will get 1 fourth of f. Get it? The force that x exerts on y is less than f. Now this makes the most sense. We know this for a fact. Okay? And this is wrong. According to Newton's third law, this is wrong. Moving on. A car of mass 750 kg has a horizontal driving force of 2. What is the resistive force acting? Okay, we know that F is equal to MA. Driving force of 2000 um, minus the resistive force is equal to MA. 750 into A. So 2000 minus resistive force is equal to 1500. 2000 minus 1500 is 500. Resistive force is 500 newtons or 0.5. 0 kilonewtons. 8 is A. I don't know why A was at 27. This looks really easy, right? An object falls freely from a rest in a vacuum. The graph shows the variation with time t of the velocity v of the object. Okay. Which graph using the same scales represents the object falling in air? So in air, what happens? There is air resistance, right? So the gradient, it can't be a straight line, basically. Understand? It can't be A. Straight line is off limits. At one point, it will reach terminal velocity. At one point, it will reach terminal velocity. So, velocity will become horizontal. It can't be D because it's vertical, it's between B and C. So, the main part is using the same skills. This is why the answer is actually C. Because check this out. Using the same skills, if we draw this graph over here, does this even make sense? How can air resistance, a scenario with air resistance, have more velocity than a scenario where there is, you know, a free fall? This doesn't make sense, right? That's why it has to be C because our new graph should be below the original graph, okay? This is for C and this is for B. B is wrong. A rock of mass 2m traveling in deep space at velocity v explodes into two parts of equal mass, one of which is then stationary. What is the kinetic energy of the moving part after the explosion? Okay, so this was our rock, it was moving at, with mass m, moving at velocity v. It explodes into two parts of equal mass. This is m, this is also m. Okay, one of which is stationary. What is the kinetic energy of the moving part after the explosion? So we need to conserve momentum. The initial momentum was 2mv. Do you understand? So, what scenario could this take place in? Basically, maybe after the explosion, this this part mo uh, moved in this direction, this part moved in this direction with a velocity of zero. 
because we did not have vertical momentum, right? We only had horizontal momentum. This one had a velocity. This one had a mass of m, right? And we want to find out velocity. So twice mv is equal to zero plus m into uh, velocity of x, the new velocity of the object. So 2mv is equal to m into vx. We can get rid of m. So vx is equal to twice the original v, okay? It's twice the original v. Now, if you look at the ke, what's the new ke, right? Half into mass into 2v whole square. So half m into 4v square or 2mv square. That is our answer. It should be d logically. 10 is d. I just check the mark scheme. It is d. Uh, it's the first time I'm solving this paper as well, by the way. Okay, so our horizontal metal bar PQ of length 50 is hinged at end P. The diagram shows the metal bar viewed from above. Two forces of 16 and 5 are in horizontal plane, in the horizontal plane, and act on end Q as shown. What is the result in moment about P due to the two forces? Okay, so this force has two components, a horizontal component and a vertical component, right? So you need to understand that this is the pivot and the a horizontal component that passes through the pivot gives no moment actually. Okay, so we only need to take this vertical component 16 sine 30. Now, this one and this one, they are at opposite directions, right? So let's see the net moment. It's going to be 5.0 into 0 0.500 minus 16 sine 30 into 0 0.500. I'll convert it centimeter to meter. 5 into 0.5 minus 16 sine 30 into 0.5. I'm getting answer of uh, minus 1.5 so this force is actually greater so it's gonna be uh, you know anti anti-clockwise anti-clockwise moment of 1.5 newton meter okay 11a a cube wxyz has sides of length 2 centimeter and mass 24 grams the cube rests on a meter rule of negligible mass the geometrical center of the cube is vertically above 70 centimeter mark on the scale okay so this distance is 20 and this distance is 50 to 70 that is also 20 sorry 50 to 70 yeah that's also 20 now oh the cube has a non-uniform density so that its center of gravity is not at its geometrical center so it is not at 70 actually the center of gravity of the cube is in the plane of the diagram what does that mean Okay, it's on the plane. The rule rests on a pivot at the 50 centimeter mark. A mass of 23.4 grams is placed vertically above the 30 centimeter mark. The rule is horizontal and in equilibrium. So net moment cancels out. What can be determined about the position of the center of gravity of the cube? Okay, let's do this. Come on. So the net anticlockwise moment is 23.4 into 20, right? 23.4 into 20. That's 468. I'm not converting the... Uh, grams to grams and centimeters okay what about this 468 needs to be equal to 24 the mass of that object I didn't even convert it to weight okay you don't need to do it here 24 into because uh, 9.81 is going to be the same for both of them 24 into distance from the pivot so 468 divided by 24 it gives us a value of 19.5 centimeter so it's actually 19.5 centimeter okay so it's not at 70 because if it was at 70 it would be 20 they told us it's not at the geometrical center but it's 19.5 it's also not at 69 because at 69 it would be 19 it's between 19 and 20 19.5 at 16 69.5 basically right so what can be determined about the position of the center of gravity it must be somewhere along the horizontal line that is 0.5 centimeter from the line WX. It must be somewhere along the horizontal line that is 0.5 centimeter from line YZ. It must be somewhere along a vertical line that is 0.5 centimeter from line WY. Okay, and we have XZ here. So, what do they actually mean? So, you need to understand that gravity acts vertically downwards, right? Gravity acts vertically downwards. So, it can't be answers A and B. 
because they're saying that it's somewhere along the horizontal line w x and y z gravity doesn't act like this guys come on so it's not a or b it's it has to be vertical so it's either y z or x z so it can't be x z right because if it's x z it will actually exceed 70 0.5 from x z is 71.5 to you know 70.5 but we know that our limit is 69.5 so if we say it's yz it's somewhere between 68.5 to 69.5 and that makes the best sense the answer should be c 12c okay what is the unit for density i'm doing 14 first okay let's do 13 it's fine a rigid sphere is held at rest on seabed when the sphere is released it rises to the surface of the sea the sea water has uniform density which statement about the sphere from its release until it reaches the surface is correct the sphere moves with constant acceleration um this is wrong because as it goes above the volume of water displaced will reduce and the value of up thrust will decrease the sphere always moves with constant velocity no it is actually you know feeling different force so velocity changes so this is also wrong the up thrust on the sphere always decreases the up thrust on the sphere is always constant okay wait 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 um a rigid sphere is held at rest on a seabed. When the sphere is released, it rises to the surface of the sea. Oh, sorry, I read the question wrong. What does seabed mean? I thought it was at the surface, my bad guys. Seabed basically means look at this. If this is the this is sea level, seabed is over here. This is the seabed okay now it's over here now the volume i thought it was at the surface my bad so volume of water displaced does not change and the uh, liquid has uniform density up thrust is v rho g do you understand so initially we do not have any viscous drag because we are not moving but as we go up uh, viscous drag increases so acceleration will change and we are ex accelerating so velocity also changes but up thrust will always remain the same because volume displaced this spherical volume rho and g are always the same so 13 is d unit for density density is uh, mass by volume so we are just going to look for that mass by volume so uh, the best one is although d is not the si unit it is the correct answer right the total energy input uh, in a process is partly transferred to useful energy output and partly transferred to something that is wasted what is the efficiency remember that efficiency is input useful energy divided by input into 100 percent always useful energy divided by input into 100 percent they just gave you w to waste your time to trick you okay this is a question from 2015 or 14 as far as i know this is a common question there are repetitions okay you need to remember that repetitions occur okay so an escalator is 60 meters long and lifts passengers through a vertical height of 30 as shown. To drive the escalator against force of friction when there are no passengers, we require 2 kilowatts of power. The escalator is used by passengers of average mass 60 and the power to overcome friction remains constant. Okay. How much power is required to drive the escalator when it is carrying 20 passengers and is traveling at 0.75? So guys, there are two ways to do this sum. I'm going to show you both ways. right? So what are they what are the methods one of them is using the energy method and one is using the force method so look at this i'm drawing it from this side it's kind of like this right so if you do the trigonometric ratio if this is theta sin theta is equal to opposite by hypotenuse which is half so theta is actually equal to 30 degrees so basically we have 60 passengers of mass 60 kg each or 16 to 9.1 now we can't take the full component right we need to take the component that is along the escalator along the direction of the escalator so In total, what is the force? The total force is 16 to 9.81.
and we have 20 passengers 16 to 9.1 into 20 passengers and into sine 30 we are taking the component 16 to 9.81 into 20 that's the total weight of the passengers into sine 30 because we need to take the component that's 5886 newtons right so we know that power p is equal to fv right so power is equal to 5886 into 0.75 so that's um, 4414.5 watts okay but there's also friction we need to add 2000 with this we are getting 6414.5 what's the best answer 6.4k 16 is b are we clear what's the other way the other way is work done by time power so we need to travel 60 meters using a speed of 0.75 s is equal to vt time is equal to distance by speed so 60 divided by 0.75 we are going to take 80 seconds to cover the whole journey okay that's the time taken and what's the work done basically mgh right so that's basically 60 into 9.81 into 20 into height of 30 so this is the total work done in a time of 80 seconds so 60 into 9.81 into 20 into 30 divided by 80 it gives us a value of 4414.5 watts and we can add 2000 to get 6.4 kilowatts got it that's the energy method right so a uh, rock of mass 40 kg is released from rest from a height of 20 meters above the surface of a planet the rock has a kinetic energy of 32 kilojoules when it hits the surface of the planet the planet does not have an atmosphere no air resistance what is the weight of the rock on the surface of the planet okay so when it was released from a height of 20 meters all gpe was converted to kinetic energy okay so basically um mgh was converted to half mv square or mg into 20 is equal to half into basically we have the value for energy which is 32 into 10 power 3 so 32 into 10 to the power 3 divided by 20 gives us a value of 1600 mg is equal to 1600 newtons or 1.6 kilonewton so that's the answer it was quite simple 1.6 kilonewtons if you like the content remember to subscribe okay would help me a lot a middle wire is stretched the wire obeys Hooke's law which quantity has a value that does not change so obviously extension changes and strain is forced by area stress sorry stress is forced by area strain is extension by length so the length does not stay uh, change but extension changes so a and b are wrong now about stress and young modulus stress is forced by area and young modulus is stress by strain so young modulus is a ratio which depends on the object what type of material it's made up of as long as the limit of proportionality is maintained as long as Hooke's law is maintained young modulus remains the same are we clear but what about stress what happens to force by area listen to increase extension you need to uh, give more force right that's why stress also changes an object is stressed sorry stretched until it reaches until it reaches the elastic limit so elastic limit is beyond the limit of proportionality where Hooke's law is not maintained anymore and the elastic limit is when after you extend it beyond that point it becomes plastic and it won't return to its original position so what does elastic limit mean it is the maximum stress for which the object obeys Hooke's law this is wrong that's the limit of proportionality okay it is the maximum stress that can be applied to the object before it has elastic deformation wrong before it has plastic deformation after this point it will become plastic and not come back to its original position okay and not breaking that's the ultimate tensile stress okay which statement about progressive waves is correct by the way polarization was added from this year so we might get content from that which statement about progressive waves is correct they are always transverse wrong sound is also progressive long and general wave they can exist as in solids but not liquids this is also wrong they decrease in frequency as their speed increases v is equal to f lambda if you increase velocity there is no guarantee that frequency will decrease this is wrong they transfer energy away from their source this is true a CR is shown determine the frequency is used to determine the frequency the time based setting is 5 millisecond per division so best estimate 
So how many boxes are we getting for one complete wave? One, two, 2.8 boxes, greater than 2.5, less than 3, 2.8 boxes maybe. So 2.8 into 5 into 10 to the power minus 3, that's the time period. And frequency is 1 by time period. Let's get it. 2.8 into 5 into 10 to the power minus 3, 1 divided by answer. It's giving us a value of 71 hertz approx. So the answer should be B. Right. Okay. Wave still 28, right? Okay. So 22. The warning signal of an ambulance has a frequency of 600 hertz. The speed of sound is 330 hertz. The ambulance is traveling with a constant velocity of 25 meters per second towards an observer. The ambulance passes and, and then moves away from the observer with no change in velocity. Okay, velocity is constant. As it approaches the observer, frequency will increase. Okay. Which overall change in observed frequency takes place between the times at which the ambulance is long way behind and long way in front? Okay, this is a common question. We know that according to Doppler effect, the observed frequency is equal to frequency of source into velocity of wave divided by velocity plus minus velocity of source. Those are wave plus minus source. Okay, so I'm going to find out the maximum frequency when it's approaching. So that's 600 into 330 divided by 330 minus 25. That's max. And what about min? That's 600 into 330 divided by 330 plus 25. Let's do it. 600 into 330 divided by 330 minus 25. Uh, that's um, 649. What about this? 600 into 330 divided by 330 plus 25, which is uh, 558. So 649 minus 558. That's 91. That's the difference. Okay. Answer should be C. 22 is C. By the way, I want to highlight something really important. This was the midline, right? 600. The highest was 649. 49 difference. And the least was, you know, 558. So it's not proportional above and below. The maximum one is a bit higher, okay? Why is this? You might be wondering because it's not actually multiplication division. It's actually addition and subtraction. That's why it's not proportional, okay? Really important. The upper one will be slightly higher, okay? Brief pulses of red, blue, and green light are emitted from the sun at the same time. The pulses travel the same distance to reach Mars. Assume that the pulses travel in a vacuum for the full duration of the journey. In which order would these pulses of light arrive at Mars? Hmm. So these are all the electromagnetic waves. This was a trick question. All of them have the same speed, so they will arrive at the same time. 3 into 10 power 8. Two coherent progressive waves from different sources meet at a point. Which condition must be satisfied for there to be zero resultant amplitude at the point where the waves meet? Okay. So, we want zero resultant amplitude. So, they need the same amplitude, but they need to be anti-phase. Okay, the two waves must be emitted from their sources with the same intensity. That means, no, 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 not at the source. So, two so uh, waves might have different sources at the intensity, but they may have, uh, I mean, they might have different intensities at their source, but, you know, at the point that two waves meet, they might have same intensity or amplitude there. So, this tricked you. The source doesn't matter. It's what matters is the point at which two waves meet. It should not be in phase. It should be anti phase. It's not about traveling in opposite directions. They might be traveling in same directions. They need to have the same amplitude or intensity at the point at which they meet. Really important. Okay. It could have been uh, intensity as well. Right. Okay. For 25, we have a corridor of 13.2 meters long which is 30.2 meters long and has closed doors that reflect sound at both ends. Okay, so listen, uh, we have two instances with sound and open tubes. So this is for tubes, right? If one end is open and the other is closed, th these are the patterns that we'll be getting, okay? Remember these carefully, okay? At the closed end, we're gonna get a note. Now for scenario two, if both ends are open, we're going to get these patterns if both ends are open, okay? 
we're gonna get a loop in the middle like this okay now if the two ends are closed these are the patterns we're getting in the corridor for example if both ends are closed we can either get this now does this match with the figure not really because in the center i have an anti-node but we need a node so this is not the pattern but the next pattern goes like this the second resonance goes like this here now look we have a node in the center so this is the pattern we're actually looking for could i clarify since both ends are closed and we want a node at the center so anti-node node anti-node so anti-node to node i mean node 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 to node is lambda by two and node to node is lambda by two again so in total we have lambda so lambda is actually equal to 13.2 meters and we know that v is equal to f lambda 330 is equal to 13.2 into frequency so 330 divided by 13.2 is 25 hertz actually okay so answer is c Moving on to 26, water waves of lambda, wavelength lambda are formed in a ripple tank. The waves are diffracted as they pass through a narrow gap of width D, and D is greater than lambda. Okay, so water waves of wavelength lambda, they are passing through a slit whose D, the width D, right, D is actually greater than lambda. So ideally, if we want a good diffraction, uh, they should be comparable both of them should have uh, the same um, you know same width the wavelength should be equal to wavelength should approximately be equal to the width of the slit but if the width is smaller and the wavelength is greater we're gonna get very high diffraction which gap width and which wavelength will cause the largest decrease in the amount of uh, diffraction so here we want diffraction to decrease further so for great for good diffraction remember this we want um, lambda to be greater and d to be smaller but here we want bad diffraction decrease in amount of diffraction angle of diffraction so we're going to do the opposite right so we want lambda to be smaller and d to be larger okay so let's do that so we want d to be larger and lambda to be smaller. The best answer is c. Twin six is c. For twin sound, we have two loudspeakers x and y, which emit sound waves that are in phase and of wavelength 0.75 meters. An observer O is able to stand anywhere on a straight line that passes through x and y as shown. The observer stands at a point where the sound waves from x and y meet in phase. So the observer can stand anywhere over here behind x in between x and y or after y so the distance o y doesn't really matter the distance o y doesn't really matter because after y crosses x they're going to travel the same distance the important factor here is the distance between x y and they have the same wavelength of 0.75 meters for example if o stands over here and they're in phase they have the same phase difference when they're released. So if X is traveling like this, Y will also travel like this. Now for them to have the same phase difference to meet in phase, the distance X, Y has priority. So we shouldn't look at OY over here. This is just given to trick you. You should look at these values because Y has to travel this extra distance to get to X, right? So your goal is to divide the distance x, y by the wavelength to see if you get integer values. Let's try a 3.5 by 0.75 gives us 4.67, 2.75 by 0.75, we get 3.67, 2 by 0.75 is Two point six seven and one point five by one seven five is two. Since we're getting an integer multiple here, it, the answer should be D. Because it travels two wavelengths to get to X. Right? It travels two wavelengths to get to X. And then they start from the same point again. So they're gonna meet in phase. Constructive superposition will occur. For twenty eight, light of a single wavelength is incident normally on a diffraction grading. So d sin theta is equal to n lambda. 
The resulting diffraction pattern is displayed on the screen, which changes make the first orders of intensity maxima further apart from each other on the screen. So n is 1, d sin theta is equal to lambda. We want theta to be greater, we want theta to have a higher value. So this can be done in many ways. Sin theta is equal to lambda by d. So if you compare visible light, red light diffracts the most. Right, so you could actually increase the wavelength. That's one possibility. So D is clearly wrong because we're using light with shorter wavelength. A is wrong because there's uh, no significance of placing the screen closer to the diffraction grating because it doesn't appear in the formula. That's for young double slit, right? X equals to lambda D by A. So the important factors are line spacing and wavelength. So our option was to increase wavelength, but that's not here. Look at B, using a diffraction grating with less separation between adjacent slits. Our goal is to increase the value of this fraction. That can either be done by increasing wavelength or decreasing the spacing between adjacent slits. So the answer is B. For a current carrying wire, the current can be calculated using the equation shown. I is equal to NAVQ. What is the meaning of N? It's the number density of charge carriers, right? Either conduction electrons or holes. So it's the number of charge carriers per unit volume. Okay, number of charge carriers per unit volume. It's not A. It's not the number of charge carriers multiplied by the volume. It's per unit volume, answer D. For 30, the number of free electrons passing a point in a wire is 24 hours. In 24 hours is uh, 6 into 10 power 23. What is the average current in the wire? So we know that Q is equal to it each electron has a charge of 1.60 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulombs the elementary charge it's in the booklet so we want to find out the average current i is equal to q by t so the total charge will be 6.0 into 10 to the power 23 into 1.60 into 10 to the power minus 19 the faraday constant divided by 24 hours 24 into 3600 So 1.11 amperes. Answer B. Okay, for 31, this is also quite common. In the circuit shown, lamp P is rated 250 volts and 50 watts, and lamp Q is rated 250 volts and 200 watts. Two lamps are connected in series to a 250 volt power supply. Assume that the resistance of each lamp remains constant. Which statement most accurately describes what happens when the switch is closed? Okay. So using these ratings, we can find out the resistance. We know that P is equal to V square by R, right? So for lamp P, 50 is equal to 250 square by R. So 250 square by 50 gives us a value of 1250 ohms. For lamp Q, 200 is equal to 250 square by R. 250 square by 200 is 312.5. So this is fixed at 312.5 and 1250 ohms. So if you add this up, since this is a circuit, series circuit, 1250 plus 312.5 gives us a total resistance of 1562.5 ohms. We want to find out the current in the circuit, okay? So V is equal to IR, I is equal to 250 by the total resistance, which gives us a value of 0.16 amperes. So we have 0.16 amperes flowing through here. Now our next goal is to find out the current required for normal performance. For lamp P, we know that P is equal to IV. 50 is equal to 250 into I. So 50 by 250 is equal to 0 0.2, 0 0.2 amperes. Fifty by two fifty. Yep. And what about Q? Two hundred is equal to two fifty into I. 
200 by 250 is 0.8. So these are the values of current required. Typically, there's another way to do this. You can actually use the value we just found out 0.16 amperes that's flowing through the circuit, right? And we can find out the current power that's being supplied. Okay. Like we can just use P is equal to I square R or P is equal to VI works. You could use potential divider to do that. So you can use P is equal to I square for lamp P. It's going to be 0.16 square into 1250. It gives us a value of 32 Watts for Q. It's 0.16 square into 312.5. that's 8 watts so if you compare 32 and 8 you get a value of 4 so P actually emits power 4 times the power of Q that's the answer so the answer is A the alternate route was using a potential divider like you could do this you could find out the value of voltage for P VP would be 1250 divided by 1250 plus 312.5 into 250 1250 by 1250 1562.5 into 250 that would be 200 volts okay this would be getting 200 volts this would be getting 50 now if you multiply this value with the current 200 into 0.16 it would give you 32 watts okay and 50 into 0.16 would be 8 watts so the same answer 32 a piece of wire has a length pointed and a diameter of 5 into 10 power minus 4. The IV characteristic of the wire is shown. What is the resistivity of the metal from which the wire is made? So we know that R is equal to rho L by A. Rho is equal to R into A by L. So the resistance is, if Ohm's law is, fo is, law is followed, the resistance is the gradient of the VI graph not the IV graph though because V is equal to IR R is equal to V by I so the axes have been reversed in this question right so you have a voltage of 10 for a current of 5 amperes we can find out the value of V by I since it passes to the origin 10 by 5 which is 2 so here rho is equal to R into pi d squared by 4 that's the area by the length So 2 into pi into 5.0 into 10 to the power minus 4 whole square divided by 2 divided by the length of 0 0.80. 5 into 10 to the power minus 4 whole square five into 10 to the power minus 4 whole square divided by 4 into pi into pi into 2 divided by 0.8 gives us a value of 4.9 into 10 to the power minus 7 so the answer should be C for 33 we have 10 cells each of the electromotive force 1.5 volts these are connected together as shown so if you look at the polarity this is the positive end this is the negative end if you want to add them up in series the positive end must be connected with the negative end okay so these are fine the polarity of these two are fine this is also fine this is also fine so it's actually uh 1.5 3 4.5 6 and so on right so let's keep on going 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 nine okay so nine of them will be added but the last one it has different polarity so it should actually be subtracted okay so 1.5 into 9 minus 
1.509 minus 1.5 is 12. It should be 12 volts. 33 is C. For 34, a cell of electromotive force and internal resistance R is connected to a variable resistor as shown. The resistance of the variable resistor is gradually increased from R to 3R, which graph shows the variation of the potential difference across the internal resistance with the potential difference across the variable resistor. Okay, so the PD across the internal resistance is actually the loss volts, and this is the terminal PD. So as you increase the resistance of the variable resistor, terminal PD will increase and loss volts will decrease. Okay. Since it's gradually increased from R to 3R. So small v represents loss volts and capital V represents terminal PD. And the EMF of the cell is E. When both of them have the same resistance, okay? When the internal resistance is equal to the external resistance, when both of them are R, both of them will actually get the same voltage. That means EMF will be divided equally between them, right? So initially, both of them will be getting 0.5E because both of them have a resistance of R. As R is increased over time, what's going to happen? If you look at the potential divider, at the end stage, it's going to be 3R divided by 3R plus R into EMF. So 3R by 4R into E, that's actually 3 fourths of the EMF or 0.75E at the end. We're going to get 0.75E but it will never reach 1E. The terminal potential difference will never be equal to the EMF because some of it will be lost in the internal resistance, okay? That's why D is wrong. 34 can't be D. The maximum value it will reach is 0.75. So it's gonna start at 0.5 in the beginning and end at 0.75E. So B is also wrong because it shows that uh, over time it's decreasing, okay? That's not possible. The answer should be A. Why? Why is B wrong? Because look at this. At, at one point, it's showing that both of them are 0.25E. If you add 0.25E and 0.25E, you're going to get a value of 0.5E. They need to add up to give a value of 1. Okay? So look at this. At the beginning, it's 0.5E for both. So if you add them up, you're going to get uh, 1. And at this point, when terminal PD is 0.75, the loss volts is equal to 0.25. If you add those up, you're getting a value of E. That's why A is correct. Why is C wrong? Because it shows us that even though this is 0.25 and 0.75, it has been reversed. Loss volts will never be 0.75E. Terminal PD will be 0.75 since it has higher resistance. Okay, the answer is A. Okay, 35. Each of Kirchhoff's laws presumes that some quantity is conserved. Which row states Kirchhoff's first law and names of the quantity that is conserved? So, it's the current law. The algebraic sum of currents passing into a junction is zero. Sum of current entering a junction equals to sum of current leaving that same junction. And it follows the conservation of charge. So 35 is A. And for the second law, the answer would have been D. All right. For 36, a cell has an electromotive force of 8 and negligible internal resistance. The cell forms part of a circuit as shown. The reading in V1 is 4. So, the EMF is 8 and the reading in V1 is 4. So, what about the reading in V2? It also has to be 4. Why? Because if resistor R is taking 4 volts from the EMF, 4 volts are left and that's going to be supplied to this parallel connection, right? So what does that mean? When EMF is equally shared between two components, you can think of this circuit in this way. These two resistors can combine to form one, right? So when EMF is shared equally between two components, both of them have the same resistance. That's your deduction, okay? So if we find out the total resistance here, 1 by 4 plus 1 by 4, reciprocal, 
is 2. So, 2 ohms. So, since they're sharing voltage equally, both of them have the same resistance. So, both of them should have a resistance of 2 ohms. So, 36 should be B. Okay, that's the logic. Okay, for 37, in the circuit shown, the cells have negligible internal resistance and the reading on the galvanometer is zero. Okay, so there is no potential drop between these two points. Understood? Because no current is flowing through it. So we can actually find out the potential at this point in the upper circuit by using the potential divider. 9 divided by 3 plus 9 into 4 is equal to 9 by 12 into 4 is 3. So this is getting 3 volts while well, this is getting 1 volt only. So the potential at this point or after the drop the potential is at 1 or we can say that this section is getting 3 volts. So similarly this 6 ohm resistor also needs 3 volts or else it won't be balanced. Okay, It has to match. both sides have to match so since this is 3 and there is no potential drop between these two points okay there's another way you could do this you could also look at this end like from 4 volts after this resistor this 3 ohm resistor has taken 1 3 volts are left right So let's begin. Uh, you have to use potential divider here as well. Okay, so for this to be divided into two parts, right? For this to be three volts as well, what does this section need to have? This resistor R will take six volts from the battery. Okay. Or else it won't match. These two have to match for the potential drop to be zero. So 6 ohms divided by 6 plus R into the EMF of 9 is equal to 3. So 6 divided by 6 plus R is equal to 3 by 9. Or 54 is equal to 18 plus 3R. So R is actually equal to 12. R is equal to 12. Okay, so 37 should be C. When alpha particles are directed at a gold leaf, almost all alpha particles pass through without deflection. A few alpha particles are deviated through large angles. Okay, so there are three observations and three conclusions. So, since almost all alpha particles pass straight through without any deflection, what does that mean? Most of the atom is empty space, right? Most of the atom is empty space. And the nucleus is very small. Okay, and when we see that a few alpha particles are deviated through large angles, a very, a very small proportion, right? What does that mean? That all the charge is concentrated in a very small region. There's another observation. Some alpha particles are deviated through smaller angles. What does that mean? Since the alpha particle is positively charged, the nucleus must also be positively charged. Okay, that's the answer. So let's look at part one. Most alpha particles have enough energy to pass straight through the gold leaf. This doesn't make sense. Most alpha particles miss all gold atoms. They don't miss the atom, they miss the nucleus. Okay, The gold nucleus is very small, so most alpha particles miss all nuclei. This looks good. Occasionally, the path of an alpha particle is close to a nucleus, so C is the best answer. 39. A nucleus X is radioactive and decays into nucleus Y. So X decays to form nucleus Y. They are isotopes of the same element. Okay, so they have the same proton number. Okay, since they are the isotopes of the same element. 
So let's see which combination works. So we're just gonna try trial and error. One alpha particle, right? So suppose this was 2010. It's gonna go to Z first after the alpha decay. So this is gonna turn to 16, 8, followed by 1 beta minus. So for beta minus, the proton number increases 9, 16. It isn't working, proton number is different. So clearly we need two beta particles or it won't match, okay? So let's try B. So it's gonna be 16, 8, followed by 2 beta minus. So the proton number will increase by 1 every time. So 16, 9, followed by 16, 10. And this is our nucleus Y. So 39 is B. This looks good. So two alpha, one alpha and two beta minus. That's one way. A positive charge meson consists of a quark and an antiquark. What could be the quark and antiquark? So it's positively charged. That's what's important here. The net charge will be positive. So look at this figure over here. This shows us the charges of all the quarks. So for charm, charm, up and top, these have charges of plus two by three. So for charm and anti-up, it's gonna be plus two by three minus two by three, which is zero. For down and anti-top, that's minus one by three, minus two by three. If you add anti to the quark, the charge will just become the opposite, right? So this is minus one, this is wrong. Strange and anti-bottom. Strange is minus one by three, anti-bottom is plus one by three, okay, anti-bottom. So this is also zero. For the last one, up is plus two by three, and anti-strange is plus one by three, okay? So that's uh, plus one, the answer is D. So remember for a meson, you need two quarks, one normal and one anti particle. Okay, and for baryons like protons and neutrons, you it's composed of three uh, quarks. And mesons and baryons they're part of hadrons. That's one family, and the other family is leptons. Right. So yeah, that's it. If you have other questions, you can just ask me. And I'm gonna link the paper one playlist above. I haven't done any videos yet, but I'm gonna complete the 2021 series soon. And the paper two video for Feb March twenty two will be here. And remember to subscribe to the channel here. Okay, see ya.